to our Wednesday night Bible study here. We're doing on the Gospel of John. We're looking at John chapter 11. I thank you for being here with us. I thank those who are here in person here in our sanctuary also. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And so let's go ahead. We'll get started once again. We're going to finish up. Yes, we're going to finally finish up chapter 11. So let's go to chapter 11 of the Gospel of John, verse 45. And as you're opening up your Bibles to John 11, 45, I'm going to give us and our time of study by. So let us pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift of this church. We thank you for the gift of your Son, the gift of your Holy Spirit. Most importantly, thank you for the gift of your love and the power of your forgiveness. But it is also on this night that we thank you for the gift of your living, life-giving Word. So lead us now, dear God, during this time as we place ourselves into your presence. You be our teacher. Let the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, come and Teach us and lead us and guide us. So as we conclude this beautiful story, this beautiful story of here found in John's Gospel about raising Lazarus from the dead, that you also use this to raise us up, to raise us up into your presence each and every day. And we ask all this in your holy, mighty, and very precious name. All right, so we worked together last week. We ended up skipping last Wednesday. And so if you remember two Wednesdays ago, two weeks ago, we finished up looking at, first off, at verse 41. And we talked about Jesus' prayer, especially where he says, Father, I thank you for having heard, for heard me. And we talked about the fact that he's already thanking God for granting his petition to raise Lazarus. But also what makes it special is he's already thanking God in advance for the work of the cross. That he knows he's got to go to the cross. This is going to lay the groundwork that's going to begin the journey. And he's thanking God for this opportunity, for what this is going to also bring about. And then we ended up talking about the last part of all this. There in verses 43 and 44 about what was missing from the story. There's no mention about how Lazarus came out. There's no talk about gasping or shrieking from the crowd. We're not told how Mary and Martha reacted. We're not even told about Jesus maybe going up and hugging and smiling and laughing with his, his best friend. All we are told is what? Is that Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. And it's believed that this was being said to the very ones that had bound Lazarus, had wrapped him up. The very ones who had wrapped up the body of Lazarus just four days earlier would now be the ones to undo their work. But most importantly, the ones who had wrapped Lazarus up were now being the ones to do what? To leave no room. To leave no room for any doubt that Lazarus was now alive. So we're going to pick up now with the last part. Uh, this look at verses 44 through 54. I'm sorry, 45 through 54. So join me here at this time. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told him what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it's better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one of the first children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went from there to a town called Ephraim, in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with the disciples. All right, let's stop here now. So, 
Back at the beginning of this, verses 45 and 46, immediately following the raising of Lazarus, so what two things happen? What two things immediately happen? First off, in verse 45, what happens here? Many people what? They believe. All right. I mean, I see somebody raise another man that we all know is actually dead. Yeah, I'll believe, okay? <laughs> I'll believe. And most of the crowd does. But what really happens in verse 46? What's the second thing that happens here? Alright? Now, what actually happened, though? Really? Okay, but do you remember something, alright? You know, you know, many of them, some of them go running off to tell the religious leaders about what happened, which means what came true. Do you remember something we talked about at the very beginning, back in verse 1? We talked about where Martha, Mary, and Lazarus sleep. Do you remember where it is back in verse 1 of this chapter? What's up? Huh? They live in Bethany. And remember we talked about the fact that what stood out about Bethany, John making sure we knew this, was the fact that Bethany is like a suburb of Jerusalem. It's only about two miles away. For them, a good you know, job, a good hard walk, they can be there in a short time. But what is specific about Jerusalem is where the temple is. And the temple is the what? It's the seat of power for who? Do you remember we talked about this? For the, not just for, for the Jews, or for the who? The religious leaders. The Jewish religious leaders. And we talked about how easy it would be for people to go and report to the religious leaders about anything concerning Jesus. Well, this is why John points that out at the very beginning. Because that's what happened. Immediately, most of them believe. But as always, you've got some many, many years. Who, have, who can't stand it and have got to run and tell somebody. And so that is what happens here. That's the result of being in Bethany. But then let us continue on. Look then at verses 47 and 48. Now it's at this point we now see the wheels being, being set in motion to now bring an end to Jesus. Now look at verse 47, that last part of verse 47. Now, in their worry and haste, they asked the, what question? What are we to do? What do we do to him? What are we to do with this man? You know, what are we to do with him? Now, in asking this question, think about this for a moment. What are the two things that they never even considered concerning Jesus and the sign? These miracles that he is performing. There's two things that they don't even consider with him. You know, let me think about it. First off, they never consider the option of just doing what with Jesus? They never consider it. Huh? Let him be. Leave him alone. Just let him go and see what happens. Just let him go. Let him keep on doing it. It never was a consideration. For them, it never was an option, okay? They had his death in mind. But the second thing they never considered is the biggest thing of all. Because not once, never one time, did they ask the ask what question? When I don't say it, huh? Okay. In a roundabout way, y'all are asking it the basic the thing in, in a roundabout way. What they never asked was Jesus right or wrong in what he was doing. You know, I mean, he had already claimed they all this claim, and they weren't going to go ask him directly like that. But they never asked themselves, was Jesus right or wrong in what he was doing? They never asked the question to, or stopped to think if what Jesus was doing might actually be whose will? God's will. God's will. Never thought about this. You know, or that God could actually be doing what? Well, I, well, testing them, could be testing them, or, or, or working through them. Jesus. Through Jesus. You're testing them, yes, test, or testing them. But more importantly, it's about, they don't even question, they don't even start saying, well, okay, is this a God thing? Is this truly a man of God? Should we be listening to him, okay? Instead, what is their response to the news they now receive concerning Jesus? 
Their concern is what? That if the people continue to follow Jesus, who's going to show up at the front door? The Romans. The Romans. That it would force the Romans to come down harder, even harder on the Jewish nation to restore what? Order. Order. Roman law. Okay? But what is the real reason? That's what they're saying. Jealous. Huh? Jealous. Oh, yeah, they're jealous. They're very jealous about this, okay? I think they were afraid. They're afraid, okay? All right, well, listen, that's where we've got to go now. Okay, you're right. Okay, look at the last part of verse 48. And the Romans will come and destroy what? Our places of worship. Our, our, our places and our what? All right. Now, have any of you got the word set of our, the words there, like in a footnote? T-H-E-I-R. Their holy place, their nation. Our temple, or mine has our holy place and everything. But a better way to translate it is actually using the words there, T-H-E-I-R. See, their biggest fear, and whoever mentioned fear, you're right, they're afraid. But their biggest fear was that if the Romans hear about all that's going on, then yes, they will come in and restore order. But in restoring order, their fear was that the Romans would take away their place of not their place of worship, really. Their position. Their position of what? Leadership. Authority. Authority over the what? The masses. Over the masses. Over the nation. See, right now, Rome, Rome was one of those, like, yeah, they were tough. They were hard. They were Roman in law. But they were also so big that they, a lot of times, as long as you weren't trying to do anything to destroy Rome, you can still kind of do what you wanted to do. Yeah, you paid your taxes. As long as you didn't go up and try and say anything bad against Caesar, you know, you didn't try and start a revolution against Rome, you could kind of live your life the way you've always done it. This is what the religious leaders have gotten used to. And they're afraid what? That their leadership, see, they're more worried about who? Themselves. Themselves. They're going to worry about themselves and their place instead of the actual nation itself. And their biggest question was actually, what will this do to my life of comfort and authority? What is this going to do to me? You see, they were afraid that if the Romans came back, that the freedom and independence that they enjoyed in running the nation, and most especially the temple, would what? Would be taken away. So they're concerned not just about themselves, but also their what? Their churches, their authority. Their authority, their careers. <laughs> their position of authority. They never said, so yeah, they're worried about Rome, but they're not worried about Rome for the sake of the temple or for the sake of the nation. They're more, their biggest fear is they're worried about what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen to us? Their way of life would change. Their way of life would change. And they weren't worried about the people's way of life. They were only worried about their way of life. And their corruption. And their corruption. You know, I said, they can get, you know, their way of getting money because if Rome comes in, yeah, one thing, they might start taking a little closer look at that temple treasure. <laughs> you know? Well, hey, here's some money here that can go more. Y'all aren't giving this to Rome the way you were, were supposed to be, you know? They were just Democrats. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying I'm not going there. <laughs> I remember, I'm live on TV. I'm not going there. <laughs> but that's not, okay, so here we're up to this point. Now let's continue on. Now let's look at verse 49. All right? So it's at this point, then, okay, they've been doing this. They're more afraid of what's going to happen to them. But at this point, suddenly, the high priest, Caiaphas, stands up and says what? It is better for one man to... No, that you don't know it. Okay, there you go. I was like, what's the first thing that comes out of this now? You people know, you, you people are stupid. <laughs> That's basically what, what one of the um, commentators from that baby said, you people are being foolish. You don't, you know, you're not thinking, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it's better for you to have one man die.
die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. Or better yet, he's, what's he teaching? Most likely came out of this. There's a teaching that's what? It's better that one die than you know, for you. One die instead of, uh, one die for the meat. Have you ever heard that? If you ever watch Star Trek, uh, what's the one where Spock dies? <laughs> that's it. You know, that's what they were talking about. He and Kirk were talking about that. Should one, you know, is it better that one die? The good of the bill, the good of the one over the good of the many type stuff. More like this is where this kind of came from. Huh? But what is it that should actually stand out? Okay, I mean, yeah, he's saying one should die instead of the nation. But what is it that should actually stand out about what kind of says here? He's prophesying. He's prophesying. He is prophesying. And it was a this was one of the typical beliefs concerning the high priest. That when you served with the high priest, when it came to the nation, God spoke through the high priest, causing him to prophesy. So this wasn't anything unusual. But for us, we're on what side? We're on, we're on the side of the other side of the cross now. We're on the side of the empty too. So we know more about. So the thing is. He's talking about who? When he says one should die for the safety of the nation. Or the, no, one, okay, but what group of people is he talking about? He said Jesus should die so that who could be saved? The nation of Judah. I mean, I'm talking about Israel. You know, they could be saved. So actually what he is saying is true. It's just what? What should stand out is it's not the way that he meant when he says it. Okay? How did the that in killing Jesus that his death was spared the people and nation of Israel from the wrath of the Roman army? But as we know, the death of Jesus, it means much more than that. His death is to set who free? All of it, the entire world. To set us free from what? Sin and death. Sin and death. Caiaphas is making a beautiful prophecy. It's his point. He just doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> and the thing is, he doesn't mean it the way that he says it. But is this the only thing that should stand out that God said his words of prophecy concerning Jesus? That's what they think are. When the Bible tells us about he is prophesying, he is prophesying about Jesus. But what should actually stand out concerning the fact that Caiaphas is speaking these words of prophecy concerning Jesus. What should really stand out to us? Okay, he, but he's more than he more than just. I'm going to talk about Jesus. Think about it for a minute. Think about what's being said. What should stand out in what Caiaphas is saying to you? All right. So that means what? So these words were actually spoken by a who? I'm not talking about Caiaphas. I'm not talking about a high priest. These words of prophecy were actually spoken by what kind of person? How about a non-believer? Think about it for a moment. He doesn't believe in Jesus. He is a non-believer. But God is so great and powerful that he can use whatever means he needs or desires to get his message out to the people. Even if that means using a non-believer. That's, you know, because it tells us what? Our God cannot be what? Limited. Isn't that a beautiful thought? I mean, I never thought about this. I've read this story. I've heard about this. But then it comes out the fact that God is using a non-believer to prophesy about Jesus. And in prophesying, you know, using a non-believer to prophesy about Jesus, then it shows us just truly how great the sacrifice of Jesus is going to be. Uh, let me read this. This is from Dr. Joe, my athlete professor, in his commentary, uh, you know, that I use more than anything else in this study. This is Dr. Joe. He said this. If a high priest 
bent on destroying Jesus could become a mouthpiece for God and unknowingly prophesy the sacrificial nature of Jesus' death, that even the tragic ending of Jesus' life could be transformed into the moment of His greatest glory. Yeah. You see what he's saying? He said, if, since God can use a non-believer, somebody who wants to destroy Jesus, then just think how great He's really going to use the sacrifice of His Son. You know, one that is a true believer in him, you know? So the thing is, this is a wonderful reminder, not just what God can do, but it's a great reminder that this is truly a great thing that Jesus did. That it's so great that even a non-believer is prophesying about it's going back, what's going to happen and everything. So we see all this then. All this is going on. But now, as we conclude the story now, this is it. We now conclude the story about Jesus and his greatest miracle. There is still just one last thing that I want us to look at. And what I want us to look at can actually be found in this one question, okay? Since this is considered to be Jesus' greatest miracle, then why do the other three gospel accounts fail to mention it in any way? Have you ever asked that question? This is Jesus' greatest miracle. Why is John the only one to say anything about it? Why do the other three gospel accounts fail to mention it? You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke knew about this event. If they say, if they knew about it, then why did they omit it? Why did they omit this from their gospel? Well, I'm going to give you two possible answers to this question, okay? Two possible ways to look at them. First of all, now I can't answer for Matthew and Luke, but I can, I can say something about Mark, okay? There may be a reason why Mark did not place it in this gospel account. Now, we know that Mark, okay, Mark gets the overwhelming majority of his information for his gospel from who? Do you remember? Probably not Luke. Trust try another disciple. Who's the big disciple of all? Peter. Peter. Mark for his life. And the truth is, I mean, also in case you just a little just reminds you, I'm sure you remember this. Mark was actually the first gospel written. Mark is first, okay? Mark is the majority of his, his information from Peter, okay? Now, when you're looking at John's gospel account, it becomes evident that somebody is, is missing. In chapter 5, mentioned in chapter 6, and then not mentioned again from chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Who is the one that's missing? It's Peter. Nowhere in John's account in chapter 5, chapter 7, and 12, is there any evidence that Peter's there. He's not mentioned at all. And it is believed, but, now let me say this, the great big but, <laughs> okay? It, it is believed by some scholars, but nobody is certain that this means that Peter was not with Jesus and the other disciples during this time, okay? See, what some will tell you is that Peter was absent. He might have gone back home. Remember, Peter has a mother-in-law, so that means what? He married, he has family. Maybe Peter had to go back. Maybe he had to go take care of the fishing business. We don't know. And it doesn't mean this for certain. All we're talking about is a good possibility <laughs> that Peter might have left for a little bit, okay? That Peter had to go take some, and that Jesus, and, and you know, that Peter's not with Jesus then, and the other disciples. And that what John says, that Peter was absent and does not rejoin them until he comes back to join them to be a part of that last Passover feast with them, okay? But now, most likely, this is not true. It's not true that Peter would not, even if Peter was gone, Peter, most likely, even if he was there or wasn't there, he still would have known it, okay? Because even if Peter was not there with them, at the time, what do you think would have been the first thing to happen once Peter got back? Peter, you better sit down. <laughs> we got something to tell you that's going to blow your 
socks off. You're not gonna, you're not gonna believe, Peter, what happened while you were gone. I mean, doesn't that seem logical? I know in my heart. Well, the thing is, I've been gone on vacation before. And on Sunday morning, I walked in and I, the preacher, did you hear about this? Or did you know this happened while we were, while you were gone? You know, I get told all kinds of stuff while I was gone. Don't you know that Peter had at least been told? And so if he's been told, he's going to tell Mark about this. So it's just a possibility. But it's something fun to think about, isn't it? So, you know, I was like, I like those what it stuff. But let's look at second, okay? We have the most likely answer, okay, as to why the, uh, why Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not include this, okay? But, you know, most likely the answer, answer not just this, but to, I'm sorry, let's get this straight. Secondly, we have the most likely answer to not just this question, but to another question that we also talked about back in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. So just quickly, flip back to John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, and tell me what event happens in John 2, 13 to 22. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. What event happens? Clearing, uh, cleansing the temple, clearing the temple, okay? Now, as I've shared with you, for John, the raising of Lazarus marked the beginning of what? Now, do you remember? I just shared talks about this. The raising of Lazarus, as far as what John's concerned in his gospel, the raising of Lazarus marks the beginning of Jesus' what? Dead yeah, power. Yeah. Well, not power, but not just his death, but his journey to the cross. Remember, we're talking about the fact this is the straw, you know, that broke the camel's back. You know, the event that broke the camel's back. For John, this is what marks the final journey, okay? His journey to the cross. But now, when it comes to the other three gospel writers, what is it that marks the beginning of the end, or the beginning of Jesus' journey to the cross? Do you know what it is from the other three gospels? We just when they went and told the, the Pharisees and the high priests got together and was trying to find out what to do with Jesus and they decided that it was better for him to die. But this is John. I'm talking about the other three accounts. You're right. That's part of John's story. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what do you think? And you just look at the story in John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what is it that marks the beginning of Jesus' journey to the cross for these three? The cleansing of the temple, the clearing out of the temple, okay? Alright? For them, this is what does it. Unfortunately, knowing this also brings up a couple more questions, okay? Why does Jesus' cleansing the temple mark the beginning of Jesus' journey to the cross for Matthew, Mark, and Luke? And why does this belief stop them from still having this added story of Lazarus to their, you know, to their gospels? I don't have an answer. We don't have an answer as to why this marks it for them. But it does answer something else. Concerning John's account of the cleansing of the temple, here in John 2, beginning verse 13, what was the question that we talked about in the opening days, opening weeks, of this story on John, when it came to John's account of cleansing the temple, what was the question that we asked, or I asked, that we talked about? Why did John do what? Well, no, no, what? Something about with John and the, and the gospel writers. We talked about something. Why did John do what? Why did John do the cleansing of the temple at the very beginning of his gospel? While the other three gospel writers place their interpretation, their version of the cleansing of the temple where? At the end of their gospels. See, this answers, at least answers that question. They put their, in their story about cleansing the temple at the end, because for them, that's what marks the you know, beginning. Matthew has it in chapter 21, Mark has it in chapter 11, and Luke has it in chapter 17. 
And the reason why John puts his account of the cleansing first and the other three places at the end of their accounts because of the significance that the story holds in their belief in as to when Jesus begins his journey to the cross. Yeah, John's was last. His, but we know Mark was first. And I'll be honest with you, I used to know which was second, but right now, top of my head, I can't remember. I, I know one of the other two, and then John's is last. We do know that John's is last, and it's not it's its own gospel. It's not considered a part of the three synoptic gospels, you know. It's its own separate account and everything. But the bottom line is, we don't know really the answer still to a lot of things. Yeah, I was just wondering if it was like Could have been. It could have been such a controversial thing that, you know, by the time John came along, or or if there was other gospels, and there is always a possibility that they did put it in, but later on, editors. These, you know, the letters have been edited. It's a lot. It's a lot. You're right. Took a lot to put everything together. Maybe they didn't witness it. John witnessed it. Very good point. I hadn't thought about that. They're not actual eyewitnesses where John is. That's a very good point. I like that. That's a, to me, that's probably the best answer of all. <laughs> Mary and, and Martha are witnesses. Yeah. yeah. They're all close. And, um, yeah, they're all close. Because they were actual eyewitnesses. Yeah. They were. I mean, he was an eyewitness in day one. So, so, I don't know. I mean, that, I, think, I like that better than anything else I've heard or read. I like that. That's yes, pretty smart. So, uh, so, it makes sense to me. But either way, that's why they put them in different places. But we really don't know why the other three don't. They don't include. They might have. I like, they're not, a, they weren't eyewitnesses to it. It was such a big thing, a big event. They didn't want to take a chance. People were beginning to question the authority of Jesus, and they didn't want to get involved. No, I don't know. I would hope that you're, I mean, it sounds good. I would hope as disciples they would stand up for the authority of Jesus and, you know, that they would say, you know, no, that's not, you know, this is his authority. Peter didn't. Well, he does later on. He, he didn't, on. and well, he didn't that night, but he does later on. But these people could have later on, too. Yeah, and they could have, too. All right, so they might have done it, then they got edited out. A lot of questions. I wish I had better answers for them. But there's some good things to think about. And if you're ever stuck for a conversation... You said there was somebody that asked, ask him that question. Why do you think that was very awful if you put Lazarus' story in there? And John did. How do you? <laughs> to see what kind of comes up in the conversation. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that finishes this up. So we'll stop here then. Finally got through all this. I was hoping to get on this chapter 12. I actually got some work done on the opening verses of 1 through 8, but it's already 6.30. So why don't we go ahead and we'll call it night. We'll pick up now with John chapter 12. So thank you for being here. I want to thank all of you who are home watching with us right now. I hope you've enjoyed chapter 11. So much great stuff there. I just needed like a bleed in my heart. We needed to take our time with it. But thank you for being here. Take care. God bless. And hope to see you this Sunday morning at 1045 for worship. And goodbye.